Hi, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this evening's live webinar from the Tufts University School of Medicine. And thank you all for joining us tonight as we present the first event in what we hope will be a ongoing seminar series on topics involving health and science and education. Joining me today are my colleagues, Liz. Oh, hi, uh, I'm Liz. Um, my background is in molecular psychiatry and neuroscience, and I'm going to talk today about uh, how vaping can affect your brain. Hi, I'm Peter. Uh, my background is immunology and microbiology. I'm going to be talking about how vaping uh, can affect your lungs. Hi, I'm Tony. My background is in uh, neuroscience and vascular biomechanics. I'm actually going to be off screen for most of the event because I will be moderating and uh, taking your questions. So if you have any, feel free to type them into the Q&A box and uh, we'll have some time as we go through to go through your questions and answer them. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm Revati Masalamani. My background is in immunology and cancer biology. So we decided to focus our first webinar on vaping because of the timeliness of this topic, uh, we've heard a lot from uh, teachers um, who partner with us who have expressed an anxiety about uh, learning about the science behind this topic so that they can convey it to their student population in a way that resonates with them. So we're here today to talk about that with you. Um, we um, at the Center for Translational Science Education uh, at Tufts University are a group of scientist educators, and we have partnered with teachers across America to develop this curriculum that we call the Great Diseases, which is focused on health and disease topics through the prism of science. Uh, our website, which you can see on the screen on the bottom left corner, uh, if you just Google us at the Great Diseases Tufts, you'll find it, but it has information about our curriculum and our teacher support, which we'll talk about at the end of this webinar in more detail. So why did we decide to talk or focus on um, science using our health? Well, two reasons. Uh, one is, as you know, as science teachers, that there is a big uh, science engagement gap uh, in this country, and it's constantly widening at the same time that jobs in this sector are increasing. And so we need to close that gap. And on the other hand, we are facing a severe issue with health literacy in our population. And as the 21st century rolls on, with the advances that we have, we need our citizenry to be more health literate. And so to engage with both those topics, typically traditional science education uh, focuses on content, which is great, but it has limited engagement and very poor scientific achievement. On the other end of the spectrum, you have traditional health education curricula, which are very engaging because they naturally speak to things that people are interested in. Uh, but they're limited in content and end up in poor health literacy outcomes. So somewhere in the middle, in the sweet spot, is health science education, and that's the zone we as a group have decided to focus our efforts in. Um, because we know that uh, teenagers are most interested in their own bodies and what's happening to them and how they're changing, and therefore if we teach them science through that prism, we might succeed in getting better engagement outcomes. And um, so that is actually what has ended up happening is that in curriculums across America that we have used this curriculum in, uh, we have seen uh, great learning gains in science achievement as well as in health literacy. So to talk briefly about our webinar today on vaping and health and just give you a quick outline. We'll first be talking about what vaping does to our lungs and it'll be followed by a brief Q&A session. So as Tony said, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box as this webinar proceeds. Um, the next segment will involve what vaping does to the teen brain, and that will be followed by a Q&A session. We'll then talk about vaping and how you can discuss this with your students, your thoughts on that, suggestions. And finally, we'll talk about how you can access our resources, both curricula as well as teacher support, followed by a and an extensive Q&A on your questions and concerns. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Ooh. All right. Thanks, Ravity. Uh, let's think we got this. That's what we want to do. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start this off by talking about uh, vaping and some of the lung damage uh, that we've been seeing recently. Uh, first, what we're going to look at is what vaping is, um, what's in the inhaled vapor, 
and then some of the reasons why people vape. Uh, so vaping is this act of inhaling these really small or fine particles that have been aerosolized into a vapor cloud. So that kind of yields the question of what's actually in um, these inhaled vapors. So the biggest uh, part of these vapors is um, this kind of liquid base. It's this glycol or glycerin mix. Um, and what's kind of important to point out here is that it's not water. So a lot of people, when they think about um, vaping or when they walk through a vape cloud, they think they're just kind of walking through a water cloud or a water vapor, and that's not the case. Um, in general, we've kind of, there's, it's these two molecules, glycol and glycerin, are uh, thought to be pretty safe, but there's not been a lot of long-term studies. And so it's kind of, uh, the jury's still out on those two. And it's the other 5% where things kind of get interesting or a little bit um, hazy. Uh, and these are the 5%, these are the additives, and these are kind of, these are particles. So if we were to take a closer look at what's in this vape cloud, we'd see these particles sort of suspended in that vapor. And right now on the market, there's about 15,000 available out additives out there. Uh, there's nicotine, so there's tons of different kinds of flavorants, uh, THC, and even dyes that you can add to your vape uh, liquids. Um, so this is really where it kind of gets to be a little bit confusing on where damage can occur and what kind of stuff is actually in the vape. Um, two of the main reasons that people state for uh, picking up starting the vape or why, why some of the reasons they talk about it is one is to help quit smoking and the other one is just sort of just generally it's, there's not a much of a perceived health risk with vaping. Um, and science has or a lot of research has kind of supported this uh, because in the past, vaping has seemed to be less damaging to your lung cells than traditional cigarette smoking. So one of the more classical studies that's been done recently is uh, they looked at some how uh, mice lung tissue responds to long-term exposure to uh, vape versus smoke. And so this is kind of what uh, a healthy mice lung tissue looks like uh, when it's just exposed to good oxygen. You see these kind of dense networks of cells all connected together. Um, and then if you expose them for four months to either vapor with nicotine or cigarette smokes, um, you start to get these other kind of uh, profiles, but not with vapor. When you do it with vaping, you get a similar network. It doesn't look like there's much damage. You still see a pretty good connectivity between cells. When cigarette smokes, you see these kind of, uh, the networks kind of fall apart and cells, you see less connectivity. And this is really a, a, a indicator of a lot of inflammation going on in your lung tissue. Um, so in general, we've kind of we've we've kind of supported this idea uh, that vaping is relatively safe, at least relative to cigarette smoking. But recently, at least since April of this year, um, we've seen this mysterious kind of rise in lung injuries, and vaping seems to really be the only explanation for it. And the particular lung injury that seems to be so worrisome right now is called an acute lung injury. And we know several things that can cause it. So like lung infections, mechanical injuries, like a car wreck or surgery, like a cardiac surgery. These are all things that can lead a, a person to develop acute lung injury. But in the cases that we have since April, none of those, none of those, uh, none of the patients have exhibited any of those. They've not gone through any of those traumatic events. And the only thing that seems to be similar to, with these patients is that they all have vaped in the last three months. And so what doctors and scientists have decided to call this is an e-cigarette uh, vaping-associated acute lung injury, or e valley So we're going to take quite, kind of a closer look at what acute lung injury is. Um, and it's this disorder in which patient's lung tissue um, becomes so damaged that it's unable to absorb oxygen. This leads to a really rapid onset of symptoms. So within weeks or even days of developing um, ALI, You'll develop this shortness of breath, this persistent cough, and some abdominal pains, as well as a collection of other symptoms that are really uh, indicators that your blood oxygen level has fallen so low that your organs are really starting to get stressed out and damaged. Um, and like I said before, the E Valley uh, category is just a, a collection that uh, of um, acute lung injuries that are really only associated with vaping and no other probable cause like infection or surgery. So what is it about these E-Valley patients that makes, that, uh, that makes them unable to absorb oxygen? So to kind of address this question, we got to take a really close up look at what's going on at the um, oxygen and, and interface of your lungs. So we're going to zoom in at the end of these little branching structures, and we see these, some of these little sacs surrounded by uh, blood vessels. We're actually going to take an even closer look at these guys. So down here, what we have is uh, these air sacs is where the oxygen that you're inhaling is coming into your lungs. Um, and these blood vessels are carrying your red blood cells that pick up that oxygen and then carry it throughout the body. And the other really important thing to notice here is this blood air membrane. And what this membrane is really important for 
is ensuring that leak, uh, li uh, li liquids don't leak out of your blood vessels into that air sac. Now, when you get damage to your lung tissues, that membrane starts to uh, lose its affinity and it starts to actually allow liquids to leak in there. And as these air sacs fill up with, um, with uh, liquids, it makes it less efficient at absorbing oxygen. And over time, the immune system starts to get involved in this process. The immune system will come in and start trying to get rid of these damaged cells. And this is a really a natural process because your body's trying to get rid of damaged cells um, to give the give space for new and healthy cells to grow. Um, but the short-term effect is that it causes more damage to that membrane and the patients are able to uh, inhale even less oxygen and uh, have access to less oxygen. So if it becomes, if they, uh, if they reach this stage, it's often critical that they seek medical attention. So what is it about vaping that seems to be causing this acute lung injury? Or in other words, what is it in vaping that's causing damage to that blood air membrane? Um, and in short, it's still fairly well, this is unknown. Um, but in all the E-Valley cases that's been observed so far, there is an unusually high amount of lipids in the lungs. And so this has allowed scientists and physicians to put together two different models. The first model is that lipids from the vape products themselves build up in the air sac over time. And kind of take a look at how this works, is you inhale these lipids and they settle inside those air sacs, and there's a little bit of an immune response. These immune cells are just coming in there and trying to clear out the, that lipid. Again, this is a very natural response. Whenever you're inhaling particles just in regular air, it's part of the immune system's job to get rid of those particles and clear out your airways. But over time, that lipid just keeps building up and more and more immune cells come in uh, and they can't keep up. And eventually you start to see this membrane get damaged uh, due to inflammation. And inflammation, again, is just this recruitment of the immune cells. Um, and that in and of itself may be what's damaging uh, that blood air membrane. The other model is that vaping, the product, uh, the vaping product is causing some sort of unknown damage. So if we take a look at how this model might work, it's that you're inhaling these vaping products um, and something that we just don't know to look for yet. Something is happening and we just don't know what it happens, it, what, what it happens to be. And that, it's, that event is what's causing the damage to this blood air uh, uh, membrane. And ultimately the liquids start le uh, le leaking in. And then the immune system gets involved at that point. So it's really a matter of when the immune system gets involved uh, for these two models. So what could be causing the damage here? Um, one thing that kind of stood out in a lot of the uh, cases that have been looked at is when substance has been reported, and that about 50% of the patients uh, have reported the substances that they've used, 87% of those patients reported THC use. Um, and so that's given scientists and, and doctors kind of a direction to look for and kind of uh, narrow the window of what kind of molecules or what kind of uh, causative agents they should narrow, they should be focusing on. Um, for example, this vitamin E acetate is something that's really commonly used in, in the uh, to dilute THC during informal preparation. So if you're getting uh, 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 THC off the black market or off the street, or if you're or, or isolating your own THC for vape products, it's common to use vitamin E acetate. And it's important to, to note here that it is not commonly used in retail or commercial sources just through informal preparations. Um, and, and vitamin E has been shown to be safe for ingestion. So if you have vitamin E uh, capsules at home or you have it in your lotion, that's all safe still, but there's not been a lot done for testing on the, the safety for uh, in, uh, inhaling uh, vitamin E acetate. And so one thing that popped up a couple weeks ago was that the CDC found that all of the lung tests, uh, all the lung fluids that they tested had this vitamin E acetate in it. And so this is right now become a big focus for uh, science researchers to see if this might have a possible cause or might become leading to the development of uh, E-Valley. But ultimately the answer is that we still really don't know what's causing it. Um, and this is largely because uh, vaping is still in a very much a Wild West phase. It's really new. It was actually only introduced to the United States in about 2007, but it's really, really quickly gained popularity. And it's still unregulated, um, and it has a very rich do-it-yourself and modifying culture. So if you just were to Google or uh, look on YouTube for ways to uh, vaping, just look on YouTube for vaping, you can find lots of stuff on how to modify your vapors, how to create your own customized uh, liquids for it. Um, and it's so hard for researchers and scientists to keep track of all these different things that are happening in this, uh, this vaping community that so far there just hasn't been enough time to research the effects of, long, of vaping. 
So with that, we're actually going to take uh, questions for about five minutes. Um, just to keep in mind, we're keeping it short right now, but at the very end of this webinar, we'll have a long session in case you have any questions that we don't get to during these uh, these short Q&As. Um, but Tony, we got any questions right now? Yes, so I have one question from Allison, who asks, um, does vaping cause cancer? Oh, that's a great question. So actually, I'm going to yield this to Ravi. She's our local cancer expert. So. Um, the, the the fact of the matter is that vaping, which Peter just talked in extensively about inflammation, right? And so inflammation has predisposes you to cancer. Why is that? Well, when the immune system uh, secre brings inflammatory cells to the site, what ends up happening is it's secreting toxic mediators to do that. And some of those toxic mediators can be carcinogenic. What's a carcinogen? It's an agent that can cause mutations in the DNA, right? And so that is usually the primary lesion for cancer is cells mutating and then proliferating out of control. Now, in addition to be in a mutagenic environment, these cells in an inflammatory state are also getting pro-growth signals because part of the inflam inflammatory process is to come in, clear the dead and dying debris, and then repair and rejuvenate. And so that ends up in cell growth. And so you have hormonal signals that are basically saying, okay, cells divide at the same time that those cells are mutating. So it's kind of the perfect storm for cancer. Now, these, as Peter said, this has been a very acute, you know, sort of outbreak situation where we don't, haven't had time to measure long-term effects, but it's not out of um, speculative belief that some of these acute lung injury cases will probably end up in cancer eventually. Okay. I have another question. Uh, this one's from Eleanor, and she asks, uh, are there any numbers comparing e valley cases in people with, who've been like medically, medically prescribed vaping products versus those who are just getting it, you know, off the streets? Um, not yet. So, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, I don't have those numbers specifically. The day, the CDC hasn't released a lot of the data on these patients um, because the, the hospitals where these people are being admitted to don't quite know what to look for yet. Uh, and so the numbers that are coming out and the reports that we're getting usually are case studies uh, by specific hospitals who are studying maybe 10 patients at a time. And then the CDC tries to put together these, these, uh, these, these reports from multiple uh, hospitals. Um, but the one thing that we kind of do know is that it seems like a lot, like it, it seems like it is correlated to illicit use of, of THC. Um, so far, there hasn't been uh, uh, vitamin E acetate identified in retail versions of THC isolates. Um, so that's the best I can answer on that. We're, not, we're unsure if it's uh, prescription based or not. Um, so I have a, another question here from Angela. She wanted to clarify something about um, the number of people with acute lung injury who use THC, and she wanted to um, know if it is 87%, as you mentioned earlier, and if you could talk more about that. Uh, yeah, so it's 87%, it's 30 some odd percent, I don't know the number, who have used it, THC alone, um, and 53% who, who have reported uh, a mixture of either THC and nicotine. I think those are the numbers. Those don't add up. They um, eleven percent nicotine only. I think. Yeah. So eleven percent nicotine yes. only. Um, the other thing about this is it's questionable. Uh, some areas in the in United States, it's still illegal, obviously, to have THC, and so some people are hesitant to admit to their doctors if they if they have smoked it. Um, some people are even hesitant to admit that they're vaping, and so there might be cases of acute lung injury developing, and there people are has it been tell the doctor that they've developed it through vaping. So right now, these statistics, they give us a direction to look for. Um, they give us trends, uh, but we, in general, we don't hold them to be too strict. And that's one of the reasons that immediately after seeing kind of a, a correlation with THC, it was the people didn't come out and say, well, we should all just quit smoking THC altogether. It was like, well, this just gives us a direction to look for. And so that 87% is what the CDC is saying is reported. And to kind of uh, add a little nuance to that data is I think right now we're at a little over 2,100 cases in the United States. 
And the CDC is only reporting about 800 people who have declared what kind of substance they've used. So only they only have information on, on less than half of these cases on what these people have actually been vaping. Uh, so that 87 is what the CDC is providing, but uh, we take that as more of a, a direction to look than a concrete piece of, uh, piece of data. So with that, we can move on to the next segment. Liz will be talking to us about the teenage brain and nicotine. Hi, yeah, uh, so as Bravity said, um, I'm Liz, and uh, in this next section, I'm gonna be focusing specifically on the impacts of vaping nicotine. Uh, and that's because uh, nicotine is the most commonly used vaping product among high school students, but happy to answer questions about THC later if you have them. Uh, so, cigarette use among teenagers uh, has been falling for decades. Uh, it's currently actually at an all-time low. Um, however, as you probably all know, uh, vaping use in teenagers has skyrocketed over the couple of, uh, past couple of years, with um, almost 30% of high school students now reporting using it. Uh, so, what's causing this discrepancy? Like, why are students not wanting to use other tobacco products, but why are they using uh, vaping products? Um, one possible reason is that there are a lot of myths out there about uh, vaping. A really common one is that vapes don't have nicotine. So uh, a survey of high school students in 2018 found that 63% of them didn't know that the popular vape brand Juul always contains nicotine. They thought it was like just flavors. Um, so in fact, vapes do have nicotine. Um, they usually have quite a lot of it. Uh, a vape cartridge is usually designed to replicate the amount of nicotine in a single pack of cigarettes. Um, and then another common myth is that vaping can't hurt you. And, and Peter talked a little bit about this before, that vaping has been seen as kind of like a harmless thing. And obviously, with the increase in lung injuries, we're now realizing that's not true. But beyond lung injuries, there actually is things that nicotine and uh, can do to your brain, especially to the teenage brain, that can be very harmful, uh, including addiction, which is what I'm mostly going to focus on today. So. What is nicotine actually doing to your brain? Um, that's what I'm gonna explore a little bit here. Uh, so here are two connected neurons, and neurons are the cells of the brain. Um, we're gonna zoom in a little bit on this junction between them. Uh, and there you find these little structures embedded on the surface of the cell, and these are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, and under normal circumstances, uh, these receptors are bound by a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And uh, acetylcholine, or I'm sorry, a neurotransmitter is just like a chemical that neurons use to communicate with each other. So acetylcholine can re be released from this preceding neuron. It binds to the acetylcholine receptors, and that causes that the neuron they're attached to to activate. So nicotine uh, also can bind to these receptors, and it kind of mimics the effects of acetylcholine. So when you can consume nicotine through vaping or other means, it can come into your brain, it binds to these receptors, and it also activates the neurons that it's attached to. So uh, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are found all across the brain in many, many different regions. So this image you're looking at here is a side view of a human brain. Um, and the red and yellow colors are representing um, places with high density of acetylcholine receptors. And you'll notice that they're kind of found in a lot of different areas uh, across the brain. Um, and importantly, uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are found in the parts of the brain that are involved in addiction. So what is addiction? Um, on a neurobiological level, addiction is kind of the end point in like a series of transitions where you go from initially taking a drug uh, voluntarily because of its pleasurable effects, because it looks cool or whatever, uh, to losing control over taking that drug, eventually make, turning it into a compulsion that you have no control over. Uh, so an addiction involves a system of the brain called the reward system, and it's a complex system, but we're going to focus on uh, three specific regions of it today. So the first of those regions is called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, and this is part of your brainstem, and it produces and releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which you may have heard of before. Uh, the next part is called the nucleus accumbens. Uh, and this is a, sometimes referred to as the reward center of your brain. And it's really, what it really is, is responsible for motivation, um, for reinforcement and learning. Uh, and this part of the brain responds to dopamine. And then finally, there's this part of the brain in 
uh, the front of your head called the prefrontal cortex. You may have heard of that uh, as well. And this is the part of your brain that is important for paying attention to things, uh, executive control, and decision making. So let's take a closer look at this system. So this is a cartoon representing uh, the connection between the VTA and the accumbens. Um, so this blue spiky thing here that I've shown uh, is supposed to be a dopamine releasing neuron. Um, it has its origins in the VTA and then it extends this long uh, extension of its cell membrane called an axon all the way up to the accumbens where it meets up with uh, local neurons there. Uh, so under normal circumstances, uh, a pleasurable activity such as eating a nutritious food or hanging out with your friends um, causes a moderate amount of dopamine to be released into the accumbens. Uh, and this dopamine release serves to reinforce the behaviors um, and motivates you to do them to do them again. And for, you know, something like hanging out with your friends or eating a nutritious food, this is perfectly natural. This is a very healthy uh, process in your brain. Uh, however, drugs can cause much higher amounts of dopamine to be released. And this creates a very, very strong drive to repeat the experience. So how does this work for nicotine? Um, well, this dopamine releasing neuron of the VTA is one of those many areas of the brain that contains the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, so when you consume nicotine through vaping or other means, nicotine binds to these receptors and activates the VTA neuron and it causes a very large amount of dopamine to be released into the accumbens. So over time, this uh, large amount of dopamine being released can lead to semi-permanent structural changes in your brain. So uh, this image I'm showing you here is zoomed in. Uh, it's an actual image of a uh, human, healthy human brain. And these like long branches you see are the branches of the neuron and the little like twigs coming off of it. Those are the sites of connections with other neurons uh, in the brain. Uh, so let's take a look at the picture of a brain with somebody with an addiction. You can see that there are a lot more of those little twig guys. Uh, and this means that this, that, um, the accumbens is having many more connections to other parts of the brain. And I don't know that is a little confusing, but basically what it means is that the accumbens becomes very powerful, uh, and it causes, um, the impulse to seek a drug, uh, to become overwhelming so that it overrides, uh, the other parts of your brain that can are important for self-control. So like I just alluded to, uh, in theory, your PFC, uh, the decision-making parts of your brain, could uh, override the impulse control, the, um, the cravings needed by the accumbens, the, the impulses to seek a drug. So this is called executive control. Uh, so uh, an example, for example, if like a plate of nachos were suddenly to appear before me right here, my accumbens would be very much telling me to go eat those nachos because I really love nachos, but my PFC is active and mostly capable. And it would tell me to, no, don't eat those nachos. It's very inappropriate. You're giving a webinar. You shouldn't do that. So that's what executive control is. Um, so, but with a person with addiction, this balance between the PFC and the accumbens is thrown off and the accumbens is much too strong. It can overpower the PFC. Um, so this is a big problem because in teenagers, the PFC is not fully developed. So uh, here's a representation of stages of development in the human brain. And on the left, you see a five-year-old brain, and then a preteen, a teenager, and a 20-year-old brain. Uh, the purple and blue are representing more fully mature parts of the brain, while red and green are less fully mature. And if you take a look at the teenage brain, you'll notice that uh, most of the brain is purple and blue, so it's mostly fully developed. But if you look at that little box zoomed in on the front of the brain, uh, you'll see that that's not fully developed. And that is the PFC. That's the area uh, of the brain that is needed to um, resist addiction. So in teenagers, the balance between impulse and self-control is already tipped in, tipped in favor of impulse. Um, and this makes teenagers particularly vulnerable to addiction, much more likely to develop addictions than adult drug users. Um, they also need less drugs to be able to trigger addiction. So for example, it's been shown that uh, as little as seven cigarettes worth of nicotine in a single month is enough to trigger addiction in many teenagers. Uh, and what's really important to note here is that uh, a single Juul pod, uh, that's a vaping product, is worth uh, about 20 cigarettes worth of nicotine. So if you can imagine uh, a teenager using, you know, using up a single Juul pod in a month, which is not unheard of, um, that can be enough to trigger addiction, uh, more than enough to trigger addiction in a lot of teenagers. 
Um, so I want to point out here that this is not, you know, there's differences going on. Um, the younger the person is, the more vulnerable they will be. Uh, so a 14 year old is going to be much more vulnerable to addiction than a 17 year old or a 19 year old. And there's also a lot of variation. Not every teenager who vapes is going to become addicted. Um, but on average, uh, this is a population that's just much more vulnerable. So, okay, you're addicted to nicotine, like, whatever, who cares? Uh, it's, if this is not causing you cancer, although maybe it will, um, what's the big deal? Uh, so the problem with being addicted to nicotine is that um, adolescence is a really important time in brain development. And what's going on in your brain as an adolescent can really set up your brain health uh, for future life. So it's been shown um, both in using experimental studies in animals as well as correlational studies in humans is that uh, adolescents who use nicotine or become addicted to nicotine are much more likely to become addicted to other substances later in their life. So what's been shown is that um, people who start smoking uh, who start using nicotine as teenagers are much, much, much harder time quitting using nicotine as adults than people who started nicotine as adults. Um, on the subject of vaping, uh, teenagers who vape are much more likely to go on to use real cigarettes uh, as opposed to their peers who do not vape. Um, adolescents who use nicotine have been shown to be more likely to engage in problematic drinking behavior like um, binge drinking or drunk driving and more likely to develop an alcohol use disorder. And then finally, uh, teenagers who use nicotine have been shown um, to be more vulnerable to addictions to other substances later in life, such as um, opioids or um, amphetamines. So uh, our story doesn't end there. Um, because remember that I said that as acetylcholine receptors are found all different parts of the brain, um, they're not just involved in addiction. So uh, what happens when somebody is using nicotine on a regular basis is that your brain will try to compensate for constantly having this stimulation by decreasing the amount of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain. So uh, here's a picture of uh, a healthy brain, a non-smoker. Um, and this is, this is a different view of the brain, but still we're having red represent places of high density of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, and this is the brain of somebody who's a regular smoker. And you can see that they have way fewer acetylcholine receptors. So the important thing here is that acetylcholine and these receptors are really important in your brain. They're actually doing really important things in many different systems. They need, they're needed for your brain to function normally. Uh, and so when you have fewer of these receptors because you're using nicotine regularly, it's gonna start to impact other parts of your brain and other systems of your brain. So what's been shown is that for people who use nicotine as adolescents, uh, they'll have um, alterations in behavior in, in other, other systems of the brain. Um, so one of those is that uh, they'll have impaired learning and memory formation. And that's because those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are present in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is really important for forming memories. Um, they'll also have deficits in self-control uh, and uh, have trouble paying attention and focusing on things. And then uh, acetylcholine is also really important for mood regulation. So teenagers who um, use nicotine have been shown to be more vulnerable to uh, depression and anxiety disorders later in life. Uh, so with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, okay, I have a question here that is about the reward pathway. Mm -hmm. Does addiction to alcohol or harder drugs trigger the same reward pathway as nicotine? Yes. So, well, yes and no. Um, so pretty much all drugs of abuse uh, that can cause addiction are going to affect this same reward pathway. Um, they're all going to, pretty much all going to increase uh, dopamine signaling in the accumbens. Um, how they do that is gonna be different. Um, only nicotine is the one binding to those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but other drugs of abuse, alcohol, opioids, amphetamines, um, THC, all of those things are going to, you know, go through some other mechanism to do that same thing. So yes and no. Uh, this question is sort of related along those lines. Um, in terms of how nicotine primes the brain for future 
future addictions? Is that just for other drugs or would that apply to other types of addiction as well? That's a good question. Um, I can't tell you affirmatively. Uh, I suspect because addictions to non drug. So if you're talking about something like gambling addiction um, or like a video game addiction, which um, they think is now going to become a formal diagnosis uh, in the near future. They're not as well studied. We don't understand how they're working as well. Uh, what I do know is that dopamine signaling is really important for the formation of gambling addiction. Um, so it is possible. Yeah, I would say it's possible, but I can't tell you for sure. And one more question. Uh, will the connections that grow in response to nicotine addiction decrease or go away if a person stops um, their addictive behavior? That's a great question and a really important one. Um, addiction is a chronic illness. Uh, so those connections, they are really stable um, and very, very, very long lasting. Um, and it, it's we're not sure if they ever fully go away. They certainly can be weakened over time as you, you know, have become abstinent for a drug for a long period of time um, and you kind of learn to, you know, have healthier behaviors. Uh, they can be weakened, but whether or not they go away is not really known. Um, what I do know is that just stopping using a drug uh, is not going to is not going to suddenly break your addiction. Um, that's kind of a misconception that like, you know, if you're addicted to heroin, but you get clean and you're off of it, you're not addicted to heroin anymore. You're, you still have an addiction. Your brain still has an addiction um, and it can relapse at any time. This is also, I guess, interesting because people think of people who go back into, you know, drug use as having weak willpower or mm -hmm. things like that. But you can see how your wiring is being changed in a more permanent yeah. way. Yeah, it's it's just like a, a lot of curb, like any chronic illness, like something like um, diabetes, for example, people will have it well managed for years and then they could have some relapse because of some change that's happened. And addiction is the same way as that. It's a chronic illness and it needs to be treated as such. We can go back to other questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, so now I just want to talk a little bit about what teachers can um, do and how they can talk to their students. So one thing I want to point out is that, you know, there's been decades of research on how best to like what messaging to use for teenagers when you're talking about things like drugs. Um, and what's been found is that teenagers don't respond super well to arguments about long term consequences. So this kind of makes sense, you know, the, the teenagers, their PFC is not fully developed. They're not making the best decisions. They're not thinking too far in advance. Um, so, you know, something like telling them that even when they're 60, they'll develop emphysema is not super salient. But what has been shown is that they respond very well to short term consequences. So I've come up with a couple of like different, you know, angles you could take with students. But my guess is that you guys are, your teachers, you're on the ground with your students. You probably can, you know, based on what you've heard today, come up with some good messaging or interesting ways to talk about it. So I want you to think about that for a little bit. And um, as we move on to this next section, and then at the uh, end in our final Q&A session, we can, I'd yeah. love to hear some of your suggestions. Yep. Um, so I'm going to give it to Ravidi now, who's going to be talking a little bit more about our curriculum and our teacher resources. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, so just to tie this all back, so, um, you know, content such as what you've been hearing about today is kind of what our focus is through our curriculum, The Great Diseases. Um, and what The Great Diseases is, is essentially, as I alluded to earlier, it has been a teacher scientist partnership, which has been really wonderful for us scientists who have gotten into education to try to bring the biomedical science that we experience at, you know, um, research universities to the classroom. And so the great diseases curriculum that has come out of this partnership has focused traditionally on four diseases, uh, four main diseases, infectious diseases, neurological disorders, metabolic diseases, and cancer. Um, and through the lens of these diseases, what students are learning about is basic biology and how it applies to health and disease situations. So um, we have about six to eight weeks worth of lessons for each of these disease modules. And then, you know, you can decide if you want to teach all of it or some of it, depending on your use. Uh, the resources that we provide to teachers are comprehensive. 
So they're freely available to you to download from our website. You'll be getting a link to our website at the end of this webinar through a survey. And when you go check it out, you can preview the curriculum and see a request us for password access. And you will see that for each lesson, we have a comprehensive set of materials for you to use. So we have PowerPoint slide decks, we have worksheets for students, and we have a teacher lesson plan, which are um, you know, incredibly detailed. So it gets you to look at what kinds of student misconceptions you might encounter, student questions, things like that. Um, so for instance, um, what Peter was talking about today, which was in the inflammatory processes that have led to these acute lung injury situations. Uh, that's something that if you want to teach your students, you will find in our infectious disease module in uh, unit five, for instance, which is about the immune system and how the immune system deals with pathogens. Um, what Liz has been talking about is dealt with extensively in the neurological disorders curriculum. So that curriculum deals with the basic concepts in neuroscience, such as what is a neuron, what is the role of neurotransmitters, and there's an entire unit devoted to addiction and addictive pathways. Um, so we know that as teachers, this curriculum, as I said, is available to you to use, um, and you know you can adapt it to your students. And we know that you as teachers know your student population the best, and you enjoy tailoring your material to them. And for that, uh, often what is required is an in-depth knowledge of content, which, you know, quite frankly speaking, the pace at which biology has advanced um, in the last decades makes it very hard to keep up with those discoveries unless you're, you know, dedicating all your time to it. Um, and so keeping that in mind, what we have done is create a suite of online courses uh, designed for teachers um, to give you kind of graduate level content to teach this to your students at a high school level, you know, with effectively and with confidence. And so the backbone of this uh, online curriculum actually hinges on and takes off of the Great Diseases high school curriculum. Uh, and it's organized by module like the Great Diseases. So we have four um, modules for the online courses. And just to walk you through the structure, because it's a little unique, uh, for instance, the neurological disorders um, online courses, they're divided into multiple mini courses. Each mini course is focused on a particular topic area. And so you can take these mini courses individually, as this beehive you know, kind of icon suggests, or you can take it all of them in a suggested sequence that we offer. Um, and you can take these for graduate credit or continuing education units. Um, these are short in duration and they're flexible for your schedule. So you can essentially, any time in the window that these courses are being offered, you can sign up and, and take the courses. So they are asynchronous in that sense. Um, we have scholarships available for teachers. So please, you know, if you're interested, drop us a line and we'd love to send you the scholarships. Um, and our most, um, you know, to be uh, released spring courses will be offered Feb 10th to May 11th. Registration begins on November 25th, but it registration and, you know, enrollment will be open through until the beginning of May. So anytime you choose to do that. Um, and so with that, um, I'd like to, you know, take questions either on our curriculum, online courses, your suggestions for how we can, you know, talk to students about this uh, vaping um, situation or any other content related questions from this webinar that you might have. Anything, Tony? Sure. Um, I mean, would you like to go over like the the vaping related questions first or the um, let's go with the great diseases related questions okay. first and then get back to the vaping so, questions. So um, how much overlap is there between different parts of the curriculum? I assume they mean probably like the modules. So yeah. typically we uh, the modules are pretty standalone. Um, there are very interesting cross connections. So for instance, Evolution is a topic that we cover in infectious diseases as well as in cancer. Um, the immune system is something that shows up in both the infectious disease module and in the cancer module, but in very interestingly different ways. So in the infectious disease unit, the immune system is all about combating foreign pathogens or invaders. Whereas in cancer, the issue is that cancer is a self 
problem and the immune system doesn't necessarily necessarily recognize that problem because it's so trained to protect against damaging self and so how do you get the immune system to respond so in a way it's a very interesting look at both ends of the spectrum so uh, there is there are some interesting cross connections in the curriculum uh, when are the online courses available by semester so we began our online course offerings in um, 2018 fall and so since then so 2018 fall we had a release then summer of 2019 we um, released uh, did a big release we had some courses running the fall of this year as well and our next round will be spring followed by summer so I would say we're pretty much trying to hit mm -hmm. every season uh, just because we know that teachers are busy uh, sometimes summer is a good time for you guys sometimes it's not and so we're just trying to I guess feel our way through what what are good times for you but so far, every semester has had an offering. Um, are you planning to do any more webinars in the coming months? We hope so. Yeah, and um, at the uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, you'll be redirected to a survey, and we'll ask you for suggestions for future topics that um, we could cover. So, if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. Yep. Um, and I have a couple, I can do one more question each back um, to the, the baby okay. products. So regarding the vape products themselves, how are glycol and glycerin used in the products and what do they do in the body? Uh, yeah, so off top of my head, I don't know, I don't know what they will do in your body. Uh, we've, they, there's been a lot of studies over the last decade trying to figure out if they are kind of a baseline state, uh, safe thing to use and so mostly this has been done in animal models like mice um, there's not been a lot of the study done in humans again because it's so new we haven't had time to move into human models yet and do long-term studies uh, but those that glycerol and the uh, glycol excuse me that glycol and glycerin it serves as a uh, base that's kind of thicker than water so you can imagine if you tried to make a water cloud and put some particles in it those particles might fall out kind of easy because water vapor is kind of light and fluffy <laughs> this uh, the reason when you walk through like a vape cloud, the reason it's so dense is because this glycol is it's kind of a sticky substance. Um, and so the vaping industry uses that to suspend those particles really, really well. Again, it's it's I don't want to say it's a safe molecule because we just don't have enough long term studies to uh, to, to say that conclusively. Um, but for the most part, what we're more concerned about is all the additives. Those are things that scientists and physicians are more concerned about than the glycol and the glycerin. Um, I actually have another great diseases question. I'll go back to that. Um, is the material only available online? Yes, our material is available online, but we do have a printing service, Mimeo, that um, offers to print, and you can get the printing code from us and then you get a discount, a teacher printing discount. So if, if that's something you want, which is, you know, stacks of student workbooks or um, uh, teacher lesson plans, then you can get it printed. The reason we have it, you know, online is obviously it's easy for everyone to access and we keep updating our materials. So it's it's just much, it's, they're like up to date. Um, I have one about it. Addiction. All right. Given the way that younger kids' brains are developed, um, are they more likely to be addicted to screens, video games? So yeah. So this this relates back to the question we had earlier about priming your brain to addiction to um, non-drug substances. Um, and what again, this is this hasn't been extensively studied. Um, like right now, um, video game and online gaming addiction is becoming a formalized diagnosis, and it does seem to be more common in teenagers. Um, the basic neurobiology would imply that, like, yes, they are more uh, prone to it because they do have those like less self control than an adult would have. Um, so my guess would be yes. Uh, however, you know, we haven't studied it all that long, so I can't say conclusively. Okay, um, we can do one more. Okay. Um, do retailers list the ingredients of vaping products 
on the packaging or online? Uh, I or are they required to? I don't know that off the top of my head. I think um, I was reading this today, and that some, I think it varies state by state. Or no, I think it's that the FDA has recently kind of stepped in and made you have to like report what you have. Um, and I, I certainly know that like Juul, for example, will tell you everything that's in there if you look up their website. Um, but I don't know if they're required to put it on packaging. Yeah, I don't know that either. Um, just to follow up on that question, though, one thing that I do want to reiterate with the, the current um, outbreak is that a lot of it, the, the evidence is so strongly skewed that it's the informal sources. It's not the retail ones. It's the ones where people are isolating it themselves or diluting retail ones. Um, it certainly, I imagine the regulation is going to change for retail, and they'll probably start requiring some sort of ingredient list or going through the FDA. Um, but for the current outbreak, it's a bigger concern on the informal uh, preparations. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, guys, and thank you for your questions. Um, we um, so we've really enjoyed interacting with you today, and we'll be sending out a survey at the end of this, as we said. Uh, we look forward to hearing about your suggestions for future webinars and hearing from you in general uh, soon. So just drop us a line. You'll find our email addresses on our website if you have questions about vaping, about other science topics, about the curriculum, about our online courses. We're more than happy to hear from you. Um, and so thank you and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good night.